Welcome to On the Bobble Podcast Episode 4. I'm your host, Sabasa J. Ueda, and with me is my co-host, Yuki Lee Bender. Similar to last week, we're going to be doing a deep dive into Dromai. And we're going to go over her general game plan, key cards, and how to play against each hero in the format. And finally, the deck outline. But before we go into that, so how was your week this week, Yuki? My week's been pretty good. Um, on the weekend, I went down to Portland to play the Battle Harden down there. Two other locals and I just drove down, made a road trip. It's about a five and a half, six hour drive for context. Um, so not too bad. We drove down on the Friday evening, stayed the night, um, and then played the Battle Harden on Saturday and drove back after the event. Um, so that was quite a bit of fun. I ended up taking Viscerai to the event. I went five, one, and one. Um, the draw in particular was a little bit disappointing. Uh, I drew into Dromai, and I probably had lethal on the next turn, but I just I just played a little bit too slow. If I had saved kind of ten to thirty seconds, I probably I think I probably would have had the game. But it was also definitely on me. I don't think my opponent was necessarily playing too slow. I think that there was a lot in my control that I could have done to just play a little bit faster. I just didn't realize how close we were to time. So a little bit unfortunate, but that's how it goes. I ended up bubbling out at a. Uh, 10th place. So not a bad uh, showing, but not exactly what I was hoping for either. Um, but yeah, other than that, just been getting ready for um, going to Europe and going to Lille. So that's coming up soon and um, looking forward to it. How's your week been, Jay? Yeah, so I ended up going to my local skirmish. Uh, so it was a sealed skirmish and there wasn't that many people down because you guys went down to Portland. Uh, I think there was about 10 players in it. I ended up going 4-0. I played uh, a 5. Yeah, it was a pretty... I think I was the only 3-0 going into the going into the fourth round. So I, I locked up first before I played my last match, but still won the last match anyways. So that was good. And uh, we also did a draft at the uh, same thing. And I 3-0'd with Icelander, and I got second place. Uh, so this was a separate event. Like we did a the skirm, uh, skirmish on for four rounds, and because there's only ten players, we decided to just do a separate draft with ten players. Uh, so we don't have to like basically say to two people, "Oh, you can't play this draft," and uh, we included everyone. But then I three would the draft and still got second. Same as last week. It was a little frustrating, but what can I do, right? How those pairings go? Yeah, the. Sometimes it's just up to the breakers when you have those small armories and people don't feel like playing the extra round, but oh well. At least you did well. Yeah, yeah, I played well. Uh, my decks were great. But gem, gem is gem is a thing. Well, let's move on to the question of the week. Uh, thank you for everyone who submitted their questions on Twitter. We really need to post a new one so we can get some new questions in. Hopefully closer before we leave, before you leave for Lil, if you can post something on on Twitter, that would be nice. Yeah, I'll probably have something up before before the listen, uh, for you listeners, um, when you listen to this, I'll probably have something up before then. So just uh, keep an eye out. And if there are questions that you'd like to have answered, uh, let us know. There's a couple that we haven't gone through, but we have gone through quite a lot of them. So we'd be curious to get more questions from you. So this week's question come from Sam George or Payne, and they asked, I would like to know how viable you consider forcing a hero or being the one sending the signals. What do you think, Yuki? In Uprising in particular, um, as we discussed in the last episode, Phi has a very deep card pool and can support a lot of drafters. And so if you end up forcing Phi, you will usually get quite a playable deck and sometimes even quite a good one. So I think in Uprising in particular, if you are not that comfortable on draft, forcing could even could be a pretty decent strategy or maybe even the right strategy. That being said, um, it's it's never really going to be totally optimal. Um, the extreme case is always like if everybody forces a hero, then there's a lot of reason to be in the other heroes because they'll be so underdrafted. And if you you know if seven people are on this would never happen, but if there was six people on. Phi, one on Icelander, one on Dromai, the Icelander and Dromai decks would be incredibly strong. So um, Draft always kind of has this nature of being 
a little bit self-correcting and and even when a hero is really good and represented a lot and maybe you can force it it will be correct some amount of the time to find that open lane of Icelander or Dromai, or maybe sometimes Fi is correct for your seed. But I think if you're really trying to maximize like every win percentage you can get, um, staying open and finding the open lane is going to help you do that. Um, but it is difficult to do. And, and if you misevaluate and get in the wrong lane, it can sometimes be quite punishing. Yeah, I think those are all good points. I think the one thing I just need to say would be uh, be careful of when you mean by sending signals. Uh, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on sending signals in general, just because you don't know if you don't know what cards the players to your left think are signals and doesn't think are signals. Uh, for example, some people might take a blue sigil or protection as a signal that uh, Icelander is open, but you might not value that card as highly as um, a blue frosting. So you pick that up and then they might still move into Icelander being like, oh, blue sigil protection, this card's amazing. So they're going to go into Icelander as well. So sending a signal doesn't always mean that the other person receiving it can figure out that you're in that hero. And so... You don't want to be too worried about what signals you're sending, but more figuring out which lane is open for you is going to be much more proactive, I think. Is that a good word of saying that? Yeah, I think it's more proactive and you have more control over it because ultimately, like regardless of whether or not the players passing to you are trying to send a signal, if you can notice that something is not being drafted that or as something is being under drafted and you have a good opportunity to draft it it doesn't really matter if they were intentionally signaling you or not um, as long as you're picking up and reading that situation correctly um, also kind of like adding on to what jay was saying about reading signals being more important is that um, you get two packs passed to you from your right, and you only get one pack passed to you from your left. So reading the signals means like you you kind of benefit for like two packs worth of cards. Whereas when you try to if you if you are trying to send signals, even if you do that successfully, you're only getting the one pack in pack two. So that that can help. But you know, if you need to draft a thirty card deck, that that's not going to be all of your picks by any means. So so usually paying attention to what you're being passed has a much larger weight than what you're passing to other people. Yeah, I think those are all good points. You want to move on to the main topic? Yeah, let's do that. Let's talk about Dromai. Okay, so first, when we talk about any of our heroes, let's talk about how many Dromais we expect in a draft pod. What do you think right now? Honestly, I think about one to two Dromais. Um, two is probably the right number. If there's one Dromai, the drafter, the the Dromai deck should be very, very strong. But I think that much beyond anything beyond two, it starts to get a bit dicey. Like even three Dromais, um, it is possible that one of the Dromais will end up with a solid deck, but the other two probably won't. And and generally, like if if I could know ahead of time if, that I was how many Dromais there were going to be in a pod and I knew it was going to be three if I drafted her, I would never want to draft her. Of course, you don't always know that, but yeah, I just think that she's just so particular about needing like the Ash generators, the dragons, the red go agains. We'll talk about everything she needs, but Dromai, maybe even more than Icelander, needs very specific cards to function and has like kind of a shallow card pool. There's, there's some underperformers, so usually she doesn't support as many heroes. Yeah, I think a big reason of that would be like Dromai really benefits from her rares more than the other two heroes. And I think that directly correlates to how many Dromais can be in a pod, where in pods where multiple premium dragons get opened, it gets a little bit more or easier for people to be in Dromai. But that's just not the case. We don't know what rares are going to be open, and not all the rares are going to be open every pod. So that's gonna lower these deck, like the, the physical deck counts, the one or two draw mice per eight man pod. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's just move into the game plan of Dromai. So Dromai, of course, can make dragons, but um, in order to make those dragons, you also need to make ash tokens. So 
I've seen Dromai decks that almost don't make dragons at all, and Dromai decks that lean more into making dragons. So I think like how much you lean into that strategy is somewhat flexible, but you do need to make sure that if you are making dragons, you have Ash to go along with it. Um, generally, pitching reds for Ash is not something that you can do very often, uh, particularly in the Phi matchup, because he's just so aggressive that if you're just taking time off to like pitch a red to play a Sweeping Blows or a Billowing Mirage, it's just a little bit too slow. So I think that what Dromai's game plan really is, is kind of maximizing card efficiency. And she can do that both um, aggressively as well as defensively. She kind of has these like overcosted phantasm attacks, these dragons that stick around on the board and force your, they kind of like a attack and defend at the same time and, and a lot of three blocks. So Droma is just really about like finding that card efficiency and trying to just like play, like, like win the turn cycle, play good, good value, you know, blocking and attacking for as much total as possible kind of thing. Yeah, I think those are all good points. Dromai is the most flexible hero in this set, I think. But it is a little bit... Just her general cards are very close to what both the other heroes can do in efficiency. So it's very easily... You can... How do I say this? You can brick a little bit easier with Dromai, where you can have some really inefficient turns with Dromai. And trying to avoid that would be the main main way to really succeed on Dromai. And I think one of the things you really should be looking out for would be Helio's Miter. And on turn zero, or if you go first, or if your opponent goes first, doesn't really matter. But to activate Helio's Miter on your first turn to pitch your red cards to start off with some ashes, if you do need these ashes, is a very easy or good way to make sure that your your first couple of turns is padded by the two ashes you can generate on turn zero. And you can generate more ashes later. Um, but sometimes if you do just try and start opening with a dragon, it could be quite awkward. And you might need to do some bad plays to even try and play one dragon if you don't have a miter to start with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you keep in mind that once you Helios Miter, if it's if it's on your opponent, like if your opponent has the turn and they're going first, um, they do still have their action points, so you do have to be a little careful, especially in Defy. Um, but if you get the opportunity to do this, it's definitely a huge advantage because a lot of Dromai's cards require, like um, like Skittering Sands and the Dragons, actually say transform target ash so you have to have an ash in play to even be able to play them even though like you might pitch a red and get the ash and go ash neutral if you don't start the turn with one in play you can't play them so so kind of like floating and having at least one ash there for you whenever you want is um pretty important you can't you can't always manage to do it but when you can it's it's very good and and starting the game with it is is ideal okay now let's move on to some key cards for dromai Let's start off with red go again starters. Uh, so these are all the cards with go again. Which one do you want to talk about first? Yeah, so I think maybe the most, probably in my opinion, the most powerful one is red rake the embers. Um, it kind of does everything. It makes ash and it makes multiple dragons. And this this card is good in every matchup. Um, the arcane barrier and multiple ash wings is fantastic in Icelander. But um, even into Dromai, if you have ash wings and your opponent doesn't have ash wings and they have to spend cards to kill your ash wings, that's just a ton of value. And um, even Phi, like, yeah, he does have the Phoenix Flames, but when you start making like three Ash Wings, it's actually quite a bit of damage that adds up over time and is hard for him to deal with. So I think that Rake the Embers is a, de a card that is uh, kind of overperforms and might be one of the more important commons. That being said, um, I think like the first one is really big value, the second one is pretty good, and then three almost feels like too much. The card blocks for two and. Um, you really ideally kind of want to be getting three, at least two and often three Ash Wings out of it. And and so I found that like three is almost like a bit of an overload, but having the first one or two copies is, is pretty important. Yeah, it's quite hard to generate three Ashes to before playing Rake the Embers. When, you, when your third Rake the Embers can generate three Ash Wings each time, I think the third one will be still okay, but that's just not the case a lot of the, a lot of the times. 
So it's more of like, if you have that ash generation somehow, it might be okay, but it's very difficult and not reasonable for you to be able to make that many ashes in every game. Yeah. And and it is worth noting that like in a sense you only really need the one ash floating if you if you pitch a red for right, because you'll get one from the pitch, one from Rake the Embers itself. So if you started with one, that means you can get three. However, if you do that, you also no longer have any ash. So it might turn off some of your dragons. And sometimes you might only want to transform two if if you know, like maybe you've been playing the game for a bit and you have some dragons you haven't seen and you want to be able to play them. Uh, you might not be able to, or it might be a big risk to try and transform that that last ash okay let's move on to billowing mirage and sweeping blows what do you think about these cards i think that they're both really good just as three blocks and uh three power go again starters um billowing mirage is the more i guess quote unquote efficient card because it makes an ash wing and it's sort of like a four for one um, but it does require the Ash to do that. And I think that we'll talk about this in the deck outline as well, but I think you really need to balance how many ways you have to make Ash with how many ways you have to, to spend it. And if you have too many ways to spend it and not enough ways to make it, you're going to have a bad time because pitching the Reds is just... You can do it in a pinch. You can do it going first sometimes if you absolutely have to, or like if you're if you're going second and you're playing into your opponent, like maybe you can get away with doing it for one turn. But like once you're really into like the back and forth of the game, you don't really want to be pitching red most of the time. And and so yeah, you don't always get the value out of it. Um sweeping blows is like always a three for one and, and it's solid and it makes an ash, but but the rate on it's not great. So I think both these cards are important because they're red go guns and three blocks, but um keep in mind there's still three power attacks and I think sometimes you can fall into a trap of like trying to hold under your hand to play these and it, it's just not always worth it. Like if you're doing two cards to do three damage and make an ash wing, it's it's not great. Yeah, and remember these cards do block for three. So if you need that three life point swing somehow, if you just block with it, it'll generate you three three life that way. Uh let's move on to the senpais or senapies. Yeah, so there's um, Dunebreaker Senapai, which is the 5 for 1 with Phantasm that makes an Ash when you pop it. This one is quite good as a starter, like in particular the red one's really good. The rate of 5 power for 1 cost is is very good, and it pairs nicely with the other Senapai, Ember Maw, uh, which comes in for 8. This one doesn't have go again and isn't a starter, but I think is still a staple for the deck just because it's so far above rate. The 8 power and 3 block, if you compare that to like brother in arms which is six power and two block uh, for the same cost you can see like just how efficient this card is so i think pairing that ember maw senapai um, with a dune breaker senapai or with a billowing mirage or sweeping blows is like one of the kind of bread and butter um draw my lines that you want to be looking out for and doing uh rake the embers is also a good one so like some kind of one cost go again into it is good but you can also play it as a two card hand and that's that's totally reasonable too yeah i think i'm gonna start calling this card senpai just because it's it's a little easier to say (laughs) yeah for sure (laughs) uh so but what is the uh what about the yellow and the blue versions of these cards what do you think about those I think they're all decent. I actually quite like the yellow and blue Ember Maw in particular, just because like a blue that attacks for six is really good. And the yellow for seven is like just also really solid. So I'm quite happy with all the pitches for Ember Maw Senefi, and I think that it's actually like a pretty high pick. Dunebreaker is okay. I don't mind the yellows as four for ones, but I would say that because you also have the liability of Phantasm on it, it is fine but not a high priority pick it's like a above average filler is how i would say it yeah i think those are all good points uh just a note uh both rake the embers bellowing mirage and sweeping blows those three are not that great in yellow and blue i don't think they are uh, the the three blocks on them are good and if you need the blue pitch i think those are okay but playing them for their card is like not not really ideal like Sweeping blow, one cost for one, making Ash is quite quite bad, I think. Yeah, I, I do kind of like the card just because it has the utility of making an Ash and it's a three block, but 
you're certainly not, mm, it's certainly not what you're hoping to do. It's just nice to have some utility in your blue if you have nothing else to do with it. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the dragons. Uh, these are all at rare, uh, at least the ones we're going to talk about right now. And we're going to start off with the zero cost dragons. Uh, they are Azulai and Chromai. So Azvali is a two power three health dragon, and it says whenever Azvali attacks, you may have it deal one arcane damage and up to any two targets. What do you think about this, Yugi? I think Azvali is a great, uh, like like a very solid dragon. There there are better ones, but I think that overall Azvali is quite powerful. Um, it's sort of like a th- a three three in a sense because of the arcane damage, um, it, it, and and blocking it is always inefficient. Um, I like that it has the three toughness in particular, like against Icelander. Um, it, it is fairly hard for them to do three damage on on your turn to kill the dragon and and end your turn. Um, and just having just in general, like as Dromai, if you have a few zero cost go against starters it can be really good because sometimes you find yourself in a spot against Phi where maybe you have like two two aether ash wings and the game is quite close and just having the zero cost starter as a way to kind of get those turn on those ash wings can be a, a route to victory and so i think as is really good for that and also um, excels in the mirror because it can sort of deal with like two ash wings or two dragons like if you ever get like hyloria and an ash wing it's just a huge blowout yeah, I think those are good points. And the other is zero cost dragons, Chromai. Chromai just says once is a three power, two health dragon that says once per turn when it attacks or leaves the air, uh, ar- arena, it gains one action point. So, which one do you think is better as a zero cost dragon? Do you like Azulai better or Chromai better? I think overall in limited, I like Azulai just a little bit better. Um, it's definitely the stronger of the two in the mirror. Um, and I think even though Chromai kind of gives you some insulation from poppers, there's not that many poppers in limited. And um, the the two health just makes it a little bit easier to kill. Um, so I, I kind of value the, the one extra toughness on Asvali and also just being harder to block. Like the two and one split damage is never going to be a clean block, whereas the, the three attack can often just be blocked by a three block. But But I think they're both decent for being zero cost starters. Yeah, I think I agree with all of that. Then next, we're going to move on to the one-cost dragons. Uh, we have three in this section. It's Kyloria, Miragai, and Yenderai. Uh, let's start with Kyloria. So Kyloria is the four-power, two-health dragon, and it says whenever Kyloria hits a hero, gain control of an item, which there is zero items in the set, I believe, and... Uh, if you don't control an item, or if you don't take an item this way, you draw a card. How is this card? Kyloria has got to be one of the best dragons. The it, the way of thinking about this card is that it's always going to trade up on cards. Um, the the four power breakpoint is is always good in flesh and blood. But when you attach a draw a card hit effect to it, it's especially good. And then when you attach a body to it as well that your opponent then has to deal with, the, the value on this card is really good. So like you think about the play patterns, your opponent can take four and then spend a card to kill it. And you've drawn a card. Um, that's, that's great value. Your opponent spends two cards blocking this and then has to spend a card killing it. That's like still like your one pitch and Kyloria for for two of their cards or sorry three of their cards so so no matter what this card's like always trading up on cards and for that reason it's quite good just keep in mind that at two health it is fairly vulnerable to Icelander I, I don't think that means that you don't I think most of the time you just play it and make them have it but keep in mind that they can kill it on your turn and end your turn um, so if you have like other dragons to attack with first you might want to attack with them yeah Okay, and let's talk about Miragai. Miragai is the two power, four health dragon, and it just says your first dragon attack each turn loses and can't gain Phantasm. Yeah, so mostly a two four. The popper production's kind of nice, but I think you can mostly think of this dragon just for its like raw vanilla stats. And um, I think it's pretty good. In general, I think you'll find that dragons that attack for an okay amount and have higher toughness are, are just better because they they take more to answer um so i like miragai a decent amount i don't think it's like 
I think like Rake the Embers is probably a bit better card than Miragai, but I do think Miragai is like a pretty strong dragon. Yeah, I think I agree with that. And lastly, it's uh, Yenderai. Yenderai uh, is a little bit more complicated. It is a three power, three health uh, dragon. And when it enters the arena, it, it enters an arena with an endurance counter on it. And then it says when Yundrai would be dealt damage, if it has an endurance counter, it prevents three of that damage and removes the counter. Yeah, so Yundrai, I think, is really strong. Um, attacking for three in particular makes it very hard to ignore. And Yundrai is always going to be at least four toughness. Like if you think of uh, maybe they Phoenix Flame this for one, and then they have to hit it for three, that's four toughness. Um, alternatively, they can just like do six all at once since it prevents the first three damage, but it's always going to be at least three, uh, four toughness and from multiple sources. And because it attacks for a pretty decent amount, like three is kind of a hard amount to ignore I, I think yandere is just really good so so again just like the raw stats on the dragon is kind of what you're looking for and and the low cost the, the one cost is very nice yeah i think both the zero cost and the one cost dragons are just great starters anyways so i think you want to play basically all of them and as many as you can get so we'll move on to the two cost dragons next we have themai and uvia uh, let's talk about Uvia first. Uvia is a 1 power and 6 health dragon. And at the start of turn, or when Uvia enters the arena, transform 1 ash you control into an ash wing. Uh, so this is a start of turn trigger. Uh, so no one can respond to this ability. The ash wing does just come out and no one has priority during this phase. How do you like this card? Um, it's very good into Icelander since you tend to have a lot of Ash, um, if just pitching to Arcane Barrier in that matchup, and the Ash Wings are a huge problem. Also, six power is just really hard. Uh, six toughness, to, six toughness. Or sorry, yeah, six, six, six toughness is just really hard for Icelander to ever answer. So, um, Uvia can just honestly win the game by herself against Icelander, and for that reason, I think she's like a decent card. But, um... I probably hope not to play this card against Phi or, or even in the mirror, honestly. Um, the You often don't have that many Ash to transform into Ash Wings off of it. And in particular, Phi can really just ignore Uvia's one damage per turn. It's not that much. They can just say, well, she has six toughness. I'm not going to deal with her. I'm just going to hit you, deal with it. And because she costs two, she's like a pretty big commitment to play um so yeah i'm not a huge fan of uvia outside of the icelander matchup what about you jay yeah i think uvia is great against icelander i think we'll talk about that more when we talk about icelander uh so let's just move on to the next dragon first uh and that's uh themai themai is a three power four health dragon and it says your opponents can't play cards or active abilities during your turn so Again, obviously, Jose's Icelander, um, four toughness, not the easiest to deal with, turns off her like primary game plan of playing on your turn. That being said, um, I think Themai is just a solid dragon all around, just because it has good stats. Um, the, the three power is quite a bit, and the four toughness is kind of annoying to deal with. Um, if you can ever play like a Dunebreaker Senapai into a Themai, that's a, that's a pretty good turn. Um, you got to figure you have like, you know, you're presenting five, then three, and then your semi um, sticks around and has four health. And, and if they don't kill it, then it's going to do three again every turn. So unlike Uvia, semi can't be ignored. Yeah. Then let's move on to the three cost dragons next. Uh, we have Necria and Vinserakai. I think that's how you pronounce that one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, let's talk about Vincerakai first. Uh, it says uh, it's a six power dragon with only one health, but it says whenever Vincerakai hits a hero, he deals three arcane damage to them. So this could hit for nine if you're at, uh, if it does connect. Yeah, Vincerakai is a decent dragon. I think he's definitely on the weaker side because of the one toughness. He's just very easy to answer. I think that Vincerakai kind of shines in the Phi matchup in particular because that's a deck that really doesn't want to block and has a lot of two blocks. So yes, it's expensive, 
but the nine life point swing and then forcing them to, to hit this, uh, well, potential nine life point swing, or if they want to block it, it's like often three cards, um, is just really solid. So I, I do, I do think it's pretty good against five, but into Icelander, this card is almost unplayable. It's so easy for them to do one arcane and just take your three cost dragon and your pitch card and the rest of your turn. So it's kind of a sideboard card. I think Dromai also has a fairly easy time dealing with this with the Ash Wings and has a lot of three blocks. So yeah, it's like a one-time use card, I think, because even the Fi can just poke it with a um, with a Phoenix Flame and it pops down. So well, let's talk about the next dragon. Uh, we're gonna talk about Necria. Necria is the four power dragon with seven health. Uh, but when it, whenever Necria deals or is dealt damage, you put a minus one counter on her and then create an Ash token. How good is this one? I think Necria might be my pick for strongest dragon. Um, the four power and pseudo seven toughness is um, is very good. I say pseudo because she does lose life every time. And so if you like, if you attack her for six, then her life total will drop to six and she'll die. Or you could do like four and one, and that would be two instances of damage. So her life total would be five and she would die. So so you don't always have to do. Um, you, you pretty much never have to do exactly seven damage, but still, she's she's very hard to remove. She does a ton of damage, and she makes you a bunch of ash, which is great. Um, the only time she feels really bad is when your opponent gets to pop it, because the three cost is such a big commitment. So, um, if she does get popped, it's a pretty big feels bad. But like this card can pretty much solo Icelander and sometimes, and um, is just very solid and very good stats against all of the other heroes as well. Yeah, one note about Necria, if you do block out, or if your Necria gets blocked out, so if it deals no damage to your opponent, it actually doesn't get a minus one counter, and you don't make an Ash. On offense, if it gets blocked out, uh, it won't lose a health, so then it you can keep on pressuring your opponent with this card without it basically taking damage, which is a pretty big game. Playing against Necria, if you're ever on the other side of the board, um, keep in mind that you can kind of, like a common play pattern I find myself doing is blocking for three, and then, yeah, they get the Ash, but it does lower her health, and then I only need five damage on the next turn. So, like, th there's a lot of heroes that can leverage this. You could then kill it with, like, a Critical Strike or a Lava Burst or, like, an Ice Bolt. Like, there's a lot of ways to deal five damage. So, um yeah, sometimes that's a way to they they still get good value out of the card. It's still you know that's still an eight point nine point swing, um, and and they get like two ash out of it, so it's it's still really good. But um, yeah, it's one of the more efficient ways to answer Necria a lot of the time is just to let the one damage leak over. Okay, so let's rank the dragons from best to worst. So uh, which dragons is your favorites, Yuki? I think my favorites are probably Necria and Kyloria and Yenderai. I think that these three just sort of like have the best stats and tend to trade up on cards. And I would say that they're quite a bit better than the best commons. Like I think they're better than your Rake the Embers or Ember Moss and Empies or Okay. Uh yeah, I think I agree. I think Necria is really good, uh, and Kyloria is really good. Not too sold on Yenderai yet. Uh, I think I like the zero cost dragons a little bit better than Yenderai right now. Just because the zero cost dragons are a little bit, quite a bit more flexible, you can block out with three cards in your hand and then just play the zero cost dragon uh, and start taking back tempo. But Yenderai still requires a two card hand to play. Uh, but the zero cost dragons you just come out of nowhere essentially, and your opponent can't really play around with it at all. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I, I like um, I like Asvalai and Chromai quite a bit as well, and they're probably like moving into our next tier. I guess like maybe about as good as the close to on par with the top commons. Um, I would probably put like Asvalai and Chromai, um, and like maybe like Miragai and Thamai a little bit below them. Um, but I, I think Asvalai and Chromai are like pretty close to, for me to like some of the better commons like Rake and uh, Ember Moss and Empire. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, Mir Miragai, Yenderai, Asvlai, Chromai, I think that's that's in like one category for me. And then Kyloria and Necria is just just like, oh, you see this fourth pick, you're like, okay, this is my this is my signal. And you know, I'm gonna maybe move into Dromai. 
Yeah, Necria, Necria in particular, I would even be willing to first spec. I think it's, I think it's good enough that I'd be willing to speculate on that card. Um, pretty often, honestly, I, I think it's like one of the higher picks in the set, probably. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so who do we have left? Uh, we have Uvia and Vincera Kai. You don't like these at all? I wouldn't say that I don't like them at all. I just think that majority of the time, actually pretty much always, I'm going to be taking those premium commons over it. So if there's like red Xenopies, if there's red rake, maybe even like dust up and sweeping blows, I might take over them. That's like getting kind of close, but but definitely over those like top three, I think, I think um, yeah, they're quite a bit better than, than Serakai and Uvia, which are like a little bit more situational. I think for myself, Vin Serakai has been very disappointing in just a lot of circumstances, so I just don't pick this card almost ever anymore. Uvi, on the other hand, I do pick uh, quite a bit, just because it's just like so good against Icelander, and when you are in that matchup, you just do want a way to like pressure the Icelander player from a different angle, and Uvia does this very, very strong um forces your opponent's ice so it forces the icelander to do so much uh that i like this as, as a, a sideboard pick more more than a main board pick yeah that makes a lot of sense to me i guess when i say i would take the top commons over it i mean like um it kind of depends how my deck's going if my deck is like already very good and i feel like i'm doing very well in playables uvia goes up in my pick order and if i feel like i'm kind of scrapping for playables she's like a little bit less important to me um if it's like early on i'm not she's not really like a reason i'll go into dromai for the most part but she might kind of like i don't know if i already have some dromai cards i might pick her up yeah okay let's move on to talking about some of the some of dromai's majestics let's talk about the six cost dragon first which is invoke dracona optimi yeah, so the six cost is just a huge commitment. You do get a six six, and what is the text on it? When you when you attack with it, you reveal is it the top three cards, and for each red, you do two arcane. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what it does. Okay. Yeah. So it can do anywhere from zero to six arcane. Um, I will say that this card is a beating. Recently, I played a draft where my I went first as Icelander. My opponent made an ash on my turn, and then they slammed Dracona Optimi and dealt four arcane off the top, and I pretty much lost the game right away. Um, actually, sorry, I wasn't Icelander. I was five. My friend also played against the same player and was Icelander and also lost instantly. So I don't think that's necessarily like representative of the card overall. I don't think it's a high. I don't necessarily think it's a high priority pick. But if you ever do resolve this card, it is a house, and unless they have a popper, like it probably ends the game. Even if they can answer it as Fi or something, it's just it's just so much value. Um, like it's like hacking for six, blocking for six, and maybe some arcane on top. So I don't know. Um, not a high pr- priority pick, but definitely a playable card, especially because it blocks three. Yeah, it's just the only problem with this card is the six cost. If it comes onto the board and if it resolves, you're going to win the game off of it. But if you try too hard to resolve this card... You, you might lose the game before this card resolves. And that's the only problem with it. If this costed like four, this card would be bonkers first pick slam. But uh, it costs six, appropriately costs six. So it is uh, the high risk, high reward card of the set, I think. Yeah, I, I think if I had it, if I, if I could take it as not like too high a pick, I didn't have to give up too much. I would definitely play it in my deck. But um. I'd say that I'm very willing to block with it. Um, don't don't get too greedy with it. But if you ever if you have the two blues and you can slam this card, like it's probably worth taking an okay amount of damage to do. It's it's a beating. Okay, let's move on to evoke Tomotai. Tomotai. Yeah, Tomotai. Tomotai. Okay, this one's the five power five uh, health dragon. Uh, this one says, whenever attacks a hero, reveal the top two cards of your deck. If there's one red card in it or more, uh, you put that many minus one minus one counters on an equipment they control. And if it has zero power or less, destroy it. The equipment destruction is pretty close to irrelevant in limited. Um, the equipment's just not that good. And a lot of the equipment in the set breaks as well. Like, um, 
you once you use it, it's gone. So for that reason, I really wouldn't rate it on that. And I think of this as mostly a five mana five five and or five five resource five five. Sorry. And um, unlike Dracona Optimi, it it does not win the game on the spot. So I think that Tomaltai is like you can put it in your deck. It's oh it's okay because it blocks three. And if you resolve it, like yeah, five five is hard to deal with, but it's it's not a high priority pick at all for me. Yeah, same for myself. I think it's just this card is just like a worse Themi. Like it's just I'd rather have a Themi over this card. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay, let's move on to Invoke Dominia. Uh before we move on to this card actually, for all of these three dragons, these three dragons are legendary. I didn't know this until this Sunday actually. I thought that if you had multiple of these, you can play multiple, but apparently you can't. And that was just like a big mind blown for me. Uh, and then just scraps all of my draw my CC lists that I was working on. But <laughs> that aside, let's move on. So Dominia is a four power, four health dragon. It says whenever Dominia attacks a hero, reveal the top card of your deck. And if it's a red card, you get to look at your opponent's hand and banish any card from it. I think that while Dominia is probably one of the better ones in CC, um she's just okay in draft um if you get the format of four four or the four cost four four that and you do the thing like you hit a red it's pretty good but four cost is just a lot to pay um like that's always going to be a three card hand and can you use the other two resources i don't know um it's not always easy to and and yeah so so i think overall like dominia is not super impactful but um She's okay. I think, again, I'd probably rather have a Themi just for the lower cost, but if you can resolve her, she'll, she'll do some work. Yeah, yeah, I think I agree with that. I think Themi is pretty close to it. Uh, they both have four health. This one has two more power. One more power? Only one more power, sorry. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, if you can attack with Dominia twice and rip two cards, it is insane, but you don't really get to control the top card of your deck much in Limited, and you you having to bank on hitting a red off the top is is a big liability, I think. Yeah, and as much as I think like your ideal draw my deck does have a lot of reds, you don't always have the luxury of playing as many reds as you want. Like sometimes you have to play some extra yellows and blues, and that's just how it is. So um, it doesn't hit as often as it does in CC either. Okay, let's move on to draw my's other mythic, which is burn them all. So this card is a uh, illusionist action aura card so it stays on the board it does have go again and it's only in red strip so it turns all of your dragons to go again but it reads once per turn when a dragon you control attacks it deals one arcane damage to each opposing hero and has a second text at the beginning of your end phase put a raise counter on burn them all then destroy it unless you banish a red card from your graveyard for each raise counter on it how good is this card I don't think it's great, but I think that it is surprisingly playable just because it is a zero cost red starter and it does represent damage that is actually like potentially pretty hard to block. Um, I have seen one or two Phi games, uh, Dromai versus Phi games, where this card actually ended up getting pitched early and man. Two Ashwings with this card out when the game's tight is pretty scary. So so I think that this card is real. I don't think it's a very high pick, but I think that if you need, if there's not much left in the pack and you need red go against starters, you can play it. It blocks three most of the time, and occasionally it can be relevant in the end game. But um, it, it's like a pretty low priority pick. I definitely take like all your powerful commons over it. Uh, Sweeping Blow, Billowing Mirage, any of, I think pretty much any of the other three block starters are, are going to be better than this card, but it's it's okay. Okay, and uh, there's uh, two more mythics we have. I want to talk about. Uh, I, all I want to say about these two is that they're unplayable. Uh, so these ones are Frightmare and Semblance. Uh, I'm going to talk about Frightmare first. It is a 3 cost, 13 power, no block attack action card. And it says, play Frightmare only if an illusionist attack action card you control has been destroyed by Phantasm this turn. And it itself has Phantasm. This card, is just, you can't cast this card, right, in this format? You can. It's just 
exceptionally hard. Um, you have to use silent stilettos, which cost three. Then this costs three, so you're already up to six resources. Plus, you had to play something with phantasm. Um, so you're so you're pitching three cards, playing a card with phantasm. They have to pop it. Then you use stilettos and this card to attack for thirteen. It's it's. I don't know if like I'm sure that somebody has pulled this off, but it's a five card hand and it's not really going to come up and the card doesn't block. So just don't put this card in your deck. Um, it's a trap. Okay. Let's talk about semblance next. So semblance is a illusionist instant and it says negate all, oh, sorry, it's a three cost illusionist instant and it says negate all phantasm triggered effects of target illusionist that attack you control. The attack loses and can't gain phantasm. Yeah, so the idea with this card is if your opponent blocks with a popper, you can respond by playing Semblance, and then their popper doesn't pop your attack. And I guess that's kind of okay, except that it costs you a card and three additional resources as well. Like Semblance semblance costing three is is a huge problem. Um, I would think of this card as a blue bobble, so a slightly better bobble. Don't expect the text on it to do anything. Um, And I think every blue in the set is better than this card. Yeah, I think so. Just a note, if your attack gets popped, you can just also use Silent Stiletto. So if you have a blue, any other blue, and you can just attack with a different card. So I don't really understand why you would ever need Semblance. Yeah, yeah. Cards just, it's not great in Constructed. It's not great in Limited either. <laughs> okay, let's talk about, or let's move on to the game plan against each of the heroes next. Uh, let's start off with the game plan against Phi, and as usual, the question is, do you want to go first or second in this matchup as Dromai? I think you really want to go second into Phi. Um, you need to be able to hit them hard early, and if they hit, and if, if you don't, you can fall behind really, really fast. If they push you onto the back foot, it can be really hard to get tempo back unless they, they brick somewhere. Um, so, so yeah, strong preference for second. Yeah, I would also just say if you're up against Phi, just don't let the Phi player go second. And I think that's a general good rule of thumb. No matter who you are, who you're against, don't let Phi go second. And I think that would be a good rule to keep to... To win more games, essentially. Yeah. And I think when you're playing against Phi, you really want to have the option to hit them hard with like a Dune Breaker into Ember Maw, because then that's three cards for, if they're red, that's three cards for 13 damage, which is actually like a, probably like a little bit above Phi efficiency or like comparable to Phi efficiency. So that's like kind of the things that you're looking up. To, uh, looking at doing uh, you could also block with three cards arsenal and ember moss and a pie and then like later block with three more cards and attack with it for eight so you're just looking to play like very efficient one to two card hands unless you have tempo um i think like dust up is also pretty solid in this matchup as just a four power that if they don't hit it you also get an ash wing that might save you a health or a chip in for damage later on um so yeah yeah, I think this is also a matchup where the chunkier dragons, mostly Necria and any of the four health dragons, can uh, do a lot of work because they'll have to. The five player will have to deal with them or take a lot of damage. So Necria being the best one, hitting for four each turn, uh, just blocking out for twelve and then hitting back for four, and they can't just ignore that. So whenever they do deal with the Necria you get to save another two or three card hand again, and you can take back tempo that way. So I think the high toughness dragons here is uh, is a key to winning this matchup. Yeah. I, I also like, um, I do like red rake if you can ever resolve it and make three dragons. Like that's a pretty good two card hand um, because you, you come in for three, then you still have the ash wings that they can't clean up right away. And they're going to continue to chip in. So so that's like another really solid play to look out for. Um, but yeah, you're, like efficiency is the name of the game. Phi is a super efficient deck and you need to keep up with that. And keep in mind that you're really not going to have many opportunities to generate Ash against Phi. And so you need to be thinking about 
I think, what is in your deck that spends Ash and prioritizing that. Like if you have a Necria, it might be it might be correct to just save an Ash for Necria and your game plan is like get to Necria or like get to a Red Rake. Like you, I think you really want to be thinking about how you're spending that Ash because it is so hard to generate against Fi when there's so much pressure. Yeah, just taking damage to try and generate Ash is not the way you can win this game. You do need to just hold these Ash, and even if it means just blocking with uh, a Chromai or blocking with one of these other dragons, it's probably better to use that as a block than to use up an Ash to play these less valuable dragons. And maybe the last thing for this matchup is just um, try to stay healthy so that you can kind of like play your one and one and two card hands when you have the opportunity to. I think like the the healthier you can stay, the better. Um, again, like against five, when you get to like kind of like fourteen ish, you're probably starting to get into the danger zone where you have to block. Um, like certainly a when you get to like eight or less, I think you can expect that they might just strip most of your hand every turn. Um, so. Yeah, if you stay high life early by blocking with your three blocks, you give yourself more opportunity to play those efficient attacks when you draw into them and look look to do that. Yeah, okay. Then let's move on to Icelander. Do you want to go first or second against Icelander? This is a close one for me. I think that you want to go second just for the tempo. Um and like often Icelander can try and hit you first, but especially if you have silent stilettos, like you can miter and silent stilettos and stop a lot of the damage and maybe get some ash. And then like if you ever open up with a dragon going second, I think that's one of the best starts you can do. Um, going first is okay too though. You can just pitch to miter, get some ash, and if you get to play a dragon, it's like it's you're pretty far ahead. So I think either one is okay, but I think I lean towards second. I'm not super confident on that though. I like going first, I think, as Dromai against Icelander. Uh, just because even if it's you play some really bad attack, like a blue sweeping blow, um, I think just being able to easily generate Ash without a risk of um, really getting leveraged by like Fi going second. Icelander going second is not as scary, and... I think the ash generation or being able to generate ash is so important that if it requires you to play a card from your hand to make an ash on turn one, you should definitely do that. And you do need like an abundance of ash in this matchup because you want to turn as many of them into Aether Ash Wings um, so that Icelander has, has to deal with it instead of dealing or pointing her arcane damage at you. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, I do think that like first and second is fairly close in this matchup, unlike maybe like the Phi matchup where it's very, very clearly second. I think either one, you're you're in an okay spot. Yeah, I think uh, depending on how your deck is constructed, if you don't have that much Ash generation, just, just go second and start hitting Icelander hard. So yeah, we kind of mentioned it already, but Silent Stilettos, very, very good card against Icelander, just purely for the Arcane Barrier. You do have Arcane Barrier from your Ash Wings, but just having the one static on the board that you start with is is huge and can save you a ton of health and, and really makes the matchup much, much better. I think it's even more important for Dromai than it is for Fi because Dromai is a little bit slower most of the time. Yeah, I think if you do have Silent Stilettos and if you have a couple of Rake the Embers or basically any, any good ways to make Ash Wings... I think your default option is to just fatigue out Icelander. Icelander doesn't have that much damage output if you count up all of the damage in her decks. If you can generate two to three Ash Ash Wings and then pitch a blue or two blues every turn to block out all of her damage, she can easily run out of damage if Icelander doesn't have Singes. And that might just be... a the most efficient and the most the easiest way to deal with Icelander than to try and keep up with her tempo uh, because Icelander can do a lot of damage in very short bursts but if you have AB4, AB5 and if you can just block all of that damage every turn Icelander has a hard time dealing with your Ashwings and Dragons in general so you do get 
to slowly move ahead by poking with an Ashwing every turn, or if you have like a Themai, being able to poke with that every turn, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, definitely agree with that. And I think that if you are on this plan, keep in mind that it's just okay to pass. Like if you have an Ember Maw Senapai in your arsenal, and let's say like they hit you hard on their turn and you had to pitch three cards to deal with it, and all you have is a blue left, it's okay to just pass and preserve your life. And if they hit you, you just block with the blue um, and that's fine. And you can save the Ember Maw for another turn. I think like overextending, if, if your plan is to fatigue Icelander and run her out of cards, overextending is one of the ways that you can get yourself into trouble. Yeah, just just draw go, draw go, draw go. Only doing AB is, is very annoying of being on the Icelander side. So that is a good way. The next card I just want to talk about in this matchup is Oasis Respite Red. This one, particularly the red one, because this is an instant, uh, but it is still a red card, if you play this card on your turn, it turns all of your dragons, uh, or it, ga- it gives all of your dragons go again still. So you can play this card for essentially no value to turn on all of your dragons if you really need to. I wouldn't recommend it that many, but I'm just saying as a as a last last ditch effort, if you need to play a red to give all of your dragons go again, you can do that. Yeah, I, I have actually been the victim of this from the Icelander side, where I hit my opponent very hard. They had one card left, and then my plan was to hit them hard on their turn as well, and they oasis my I think it was like an ice bolt, and then gave all their dragons go again, and that was um, that was quite bad for me. Okay, and let's talk about life threshold. How much health do you want to be as Droma against Icelander? Honestly, just the higher the better. I think that if you have lots of Ashwing generation and you have lots of, um, you have like the silent stilettos, um, you can just sit back, make them show you that they can kill you and just preserve your life total. Um, you tend to get quite a bit of ash because you can just pitch your reds into arcane barrier and then you can play your dragons, which are hard for her to deal with. And it's not to say you can't attack, but it's not um you it, the I would I would say the pressure is on Icelander to end the game more so than it is for you. If the game the longer the game goes, the better the game is for you. So just preserve your life as much as you can. Okay, and then let's move on to our last one, which is the mirror. Do you want to go first or second in the mirror? I think in the mirror, I want to go second, but I, I I will give the caveat that I haven't played this matchup very much. I played it like once or twice. Um, I I think that so I think that the mirror is very value oriented, and that like often you play most of the cards in your deck. It's it's almost kind of like a guardian mirror where you it's, it's like about efficiency and kind of like setting up second cycle and trading cards for cards and like how efficiently you do that. Um, so I think that going second and being able to get some tempo is like pretty good, but I am not entirely confident that that is the case i could definitely see just like going first and making some ash to set up your dragons being like also very strong so this is the one i'm probably the least confident on about first or second yeah for myself as well i haven't i don't think i've ever played the mirror yet uh most of the time when i am on dromai i just only face icelanders and fies because of how as we said earlier uh, in a draft pod, we should really only be in it if we're the only Dromai or two Dromais. And it's just hard to play the mirror in these situations where you're the only Dromai on the pod. And yeah, I don't think it matters too much because as Yuki said, it's like the old mirror where you just need to play the most efficient and not deck out. Uh, this will go to fatigue a lot. And because we don't have a weapon, unlike the older mirrors where the game will slowly, slowly deck each other out and then the last person with like the the blue pitch wins, in this matchup it and typically ends up being who can keep their last ash wing and that might win the game. So maybe even holding an extra ash wing generation or a way to make an ash wing might be the best way to um, end the game if it does go to fatigue. But otherwise, 
you just want to be playing your highest rate turns every single turn uh, and chipping away uh, for 20 damage, I think might be the way to go. Yeah, for sure. Um, you definitely need to manage the dragons. And I think that, like in particular, Red Rake is a key card because the Ashwings are very good at answering other Ashwings, but are very annoying if you have to spend cards on them. So I think that if you can arsenal a Red Rake and save it so that when they play their Red Rake, you can then play yours and clear all their Ashwings and then put the impetus on them to have to deal with all your ash wings that's like a pretty good way to get ahead so it's like a kind of a game of chicken that being said if you play red rake and your opponent doesn't have red rake you can get pretty rewarded and just pull ahead that way too so it, it's interesting it just kind of depends if they have it or not but um something to consider uh, i think that red rake is quite a important card in the matchup yeah uh another note you can also just pitch red rake it also generates you an ash and then on second cycle you can play it as well yeah, absolutely. Um, another overperformer, I think, is Dust Up, just because, again, like the Ashwings are quite annoying to deal with, and then it demands two cards if they want to block it out. So this is kind of like, a, if you think of them like a cards and deck perspective, this is almost always trading for two cards as a zero cost, which is just like really good in a matchup that can go to fatigue. Okay, let's move on to deck outline. Uh, so how do you want these decks to look right now? Yeah, so I think it can be fairly flexible, and it kind of depends on the cards in your deck. Um, I think that Dromai can benefit quite a bit from having a sideboard, um, in particular like the Oasis Respites, and um, we didn't mention this, but Sand Cover into Icelander as well is like also a pretty reasonable sideboard card. Honestly, even the yellows, like if, if you're on the Fatigue plan, Sand Cover is just a pretty solid card. You can play some extra blues as well. Um, so I think that Dromai maybe more so than a lot of decks benefits from having like different sideboard options and can be configured differently depending on if she's on the the dragon plan or if she's on the uh, more like aggro beatdown Senpai plan or some combination. I think the the problem with Dromai would be that if she gets locked up into 30 cards and don't really have a sideboard, you become too weak against either Fi or Icelander, and then that can really destroy your hopes of trying to 3-0 in the, in the draft. Um, so you really do need to be on the open lane for uh, Dromai, and really changing your deck will be the key to going 3-0 with Dromai. It's fairly easy if you do like hedge against Phi um, and like not really have much for Icelander. You could also do that too. Uh, and then that should get you to 1, 1, 2 in that area, but it's just going to be hard whenever you do face Icelander. So, do you know about how many blues you want in this deck or how many reds? Which, which one's the most important color you're looking at here? I, th I think that the, car, the color to prioritize is definitely red. You need a like you want, as much as you can't pitch reds for Ash too much, you want to have the option to do it. And the red go against starters are pretty important. I think that I usually want like at least eight, like eight to 10 is pretty good if you're on the dragon slash Ashwing plan. Like you don't have to be like heavy on that plan, but if you have dragons and Ashwings that you're making, you have like your, um, what is the equipment? The um... Silken form? The silken form, yeah, the silken form to make ash wings. If, if you have these cards, like you really want to have the red go against starters, and there's just no substitute for them. And I think that's part of why Dromai doesn't support as many players is you just need this critical density of those of those starters. Um, so I think that's like the biggest priority for me. And then after that, I probably want to have like six to eight blues against Phi, and then you can board up. Um, Honestly, you could board up to pretty much as many blues as you want against Icelander if you're planning to fatigue. But um, I think most decks function pretty well on about like eight-ish blues. Like that's about like one blue per turn. So yeah, Droma usually wants to be able to play dragons or play your centipies and, and do that game plan. Yeah, I think that just about sums it up. And I did notice at this point that we didn't talk about Silken Form. Uh, let's talk about that card. 
Yeah, so this probably should have been under key cards. Silken form is a really powerful piece of equipment. Um, you can quell with it and note that you can use it for the quell one and then activate it to make an Ashwing. That is like, so it's just like a one, one. So this card can be worth like a ton of value if you get the quell and then the Ashwing. But sometimes even just making the Ashwing is really, really solid and I wouldn't be afraid to do it. Um, especially against Phi, like I might be pretty aggressive with the activation of Silken Form, just because like sometimes you just need that pressure of the Ashwing to keep up with them. Yeah, I would... Uh, b- basically, on the first chance I get that I think I can start ripping Phi's hand, I'm going to destroy Silken Form on my turn without even quelling uh, to turn one of my Ash into Ashwings and start poking for one. If the Phi player ignores this Ashwing, it can start... Uh, steam, uh, not steamrolling, but just like we'll start to get annoying for the five player, and just one damage is a lot. Like this, if you've played in Tales of Aria, Mark of Lightning was a very powerful card just because it did one unblockable damage. Silken Form can do very similar. Uh, it can turn an ash into an ash wing on a turn you've already activated all your dragons. And you can do one surprise damage that they're not expecting. And that could go very, very long ways. The last thing about sort of the deck outline here is I think that you really want to be conscious about how many ways you have to generate Ash versus ways to spend Ash. The primary ways of generating Ash, I really mean like sort of rake the embers, but is like also a spender. And Sweeping Blows is like maybe the biggest one. If you have red Sweeping Blows, that's like your main Ash generator. Um, you can pitch reds, but you you don't, like as we said against in the Phi matchup, you just don't have time to do this. So you really don't want that many dragons. Like I've had decks with like two to three good dragons and like two Rake the Embers, and those were kind of, those were my, my spenders. And I had like, e- even when I have like four... Uh, I've had decks like this with like four sweeping blows, and it still just feels like that's kind of about what I can support. A few a few dragons and a few rake the embers, and that's kind of about it. Um, I think that like going too hard on the dragon plan, especially without the support, can be a little bit of a trap for Dromai. Yeah, I think Dromai is the, one of the most challenging decks to pilot, where... You need to really, during the game, uh, manage your Ash and how many dragons and how many payoffs you can do. I've seen a couple players uh, generate like 14 or 15 Ashes without using any of them, and then they lose the game. Uh, That's also not good if you have too many Ash generations, you just aren't spending them or aren't doing anything with them. It's not going to do you any good. You Like these Ashes you have to spend something to make these ashes, so you have to make use of them or you're going to fall behind on card efficiency somewhere. Yeah, because like if you think about Sweeping Blows as a three-for-one go again, the rate on that card is pretty bad. Like, Phi has four-for-one go agains, And like, yeah, they block too, but you know, offensively, the card is just much better. So that sweeping blow ash is kind of like costing you like like a whole point of damage is kind of like what it's valued as on the card. And so you, if you're playing, like it, it's a good card because in, in red, because it gives your, your other dragons go again, but you want to be making use of that ash. And if you're not, you're just kind of playing an inefficient card and leaving value on the table. So you, you need to really have both the generators as well as the payoffs. Otherwise it's, it just... You're just kind of playing cards in your deck that aren't great. Okay. Um, I don't have anything else to say about Icelander. What about you? Uh, no, I think that pretty much wraps us up for Dromai. I do think that um, she is probably the most difficult deck to draft and pilot, and also the most prone to being overdrafted. Um, just in general, like a lot of her yellows and blues are kind of junky. You can play them if you have to, um, like the and, and you prioritize the three blocks, but Overall, like her card pool has some really poor cards. Like I think like the yellow and blue skittering and the yellow and blues actually just sand cover in general, just like really <laughs> stand out as like pretty awkward cards. I, I also don't like skittering just because like it, it blocks too and you have to have an ash to play it. So it's just kind of like locks you into spending and 
I don't know. It's okay. The red one's okay, but it's not great. All right. Um, I think that concludes this episode of On the Bobble. Um, you can find us on YouTube and Spotify. And um, if there's certain platforms that you're wanting to see this uh, podcast on, please let us know and we can add it on there as well. Um, as always, we are your hosts, Yuki and Jay, and you can find me on Twitter at Yukili Bender, or you can find some of my articles on redriotgames.ca. Um, Jay's currently not active on social media, but if you want to reach out to him, you can at um, you can email on the bobble at gmail.com and get in touch with him that way. Thank you so much for listening. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and goodbye for now. I guess we can also talk about our sealed money matches at Nats. Uh, that's not a bad one. Didn't Ross like end up taking all our money? Actually, Ross and Mateo took all of our money. No, I think Ross took all our money. Mateo opened Shock Charmers. Okay, we're going to talk about this now because there's enough content on this now. Okay, so... At Nationals, 2021 Nationals, where Yuki wins this event, uh, I think it's after day one, correct? Yeah, after day one, um, our hotel room, so that's Jay, myself, and then two of our locals, Ross and Mateo, um, decide that we haven't had enough flesh and blood after nine rounds. So the thing to do is clearly get a box of Tales of Aria and play sealed and I mean, if you're just playing limited, what's the point? You you got to be playing for something, right? So we decided to to play for money, and um, Ross in particular is not so wasn't so used to like just playing casual games for money, like outside of an armory setting. So um, we had kind of talked him into playing money matches with us um, for for less. I think we were playing for like ten bucks, uh, ten bucks a match, kind of a thing. And, um, yeah, it was pretty funny because after we kind of, like, convinced him and twisted his arm to do it, he just took all of our money and <laughs> ended up beating all of us, um, even though we were the most keen on it. And he was uh, he was quite pleased with himself. And then, um, yeah, how did your games against Mateo go? Oh, I think we ended up in the room. We played inside the drawer. So like we opened up one of the, the like the, there's a the TV monitor on the hotel and there's like drawers to put your clothes in. We opened one of that up because we're in a hotel room with no tables, right? There's no tables to play on. I think uh, like Yuki and Ross was playing on the bed or something that was like very reasonable to do. But we're just like, okay, so they took that. What do we need to use? We just opened up the drawer and we sat on both sides of it and we're just playing flesh and blood inside the drawer now. Uh, I don't actually remember if I won or lost that game at this point, but that's the only thing I remember is like having cards, like just like, um, we're just like throwing cards in this drawer and then Yuki and Ross just looking at us and being like, what are you guys doing? And we're like, it's like a perfect platform. It's like it's clean inside. It's just a flat surface and like someone can't accidentally knock over our decks by like moving the bed too much. Yeah, so if you're ever in a pinch and you really want to play some sealed after you've played all day, you you know what to do. You can play in the drawer. It's actually pretty good. Um, I, and I actually do remember how the match went because I remember um, Jay and Mateo got paired first. And when they were playing, Mateo flips over Shock Charmers because he opened Shock Charmers in his pool. And Jay was going, what? You opened Shock Charmers and I'm on Briar? This is busted. And then sure enough, I think you were attacking for lethal with Rosetta Thorn and he just Shock Charmers to Rosetta Thorn. Oh, is that what happened? I remember him opening Shock Charmers because that was like the money card to be open and then he got to keep that. Uh, and then I, I, I guess I, I lost to it too, right? <laughs> I definitely remember you saying that he stopped your arcane damage with his shock charmers, and it it mattered a lot. Um, I don't know for sure who would have won. Like sometimes it changes the game significantly, but um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was relevant. Game. Yeah, now 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 that you tell me, yeah, I'm pretty sure it won him the game because Spell Void Two is very powerful. <laughs> yeah. So after Jay and I are the uh, 
I also ended up losing to both Mateo and Ross. So after Jay and I convinced the others to to play uh, money matches with us, we we proceeded to just give them all of our money. So oh, I think I lo- didn't I lose to you though. Yeah, I think I think I ended up beating you. So yeah, uh, so I went o three. Yeah, I got some money back, but it wasn't a great night for either of us. We also both opened like nothing, know, nothing particularly <laughs> notable. But you know what? It was fun. It was fun. It was a good. It was a good weekend. And then, and then, and then on the next day, I get destroyed by Yuki and Limited again. So it was a bad weekend for me, but uh, it's something. <laughs> Okay, I think that should be good. And good night. And next week, we're going to be talking about Yuki's Pro Tour prep. So don't miss that one. Bye-bye. Bye now.